So I wonder how many dentists here are in private practice? Could you raise your hands if you're in private practice? Great. So it's mostly an academic audience. Um, and my lecture is toned toward private practice. Um, I'm going to teach you a model of dentistry that I think is the future. Uh, some of the speakers have talked about diet uh, and changes of lifestyle of being important. And I'm going to go a little further with that. But basically, uh, I'm in Tribeca in Lower Manhattan, and I've been doing this for over 30 years. Um, I do, my practice is $2 million a year, and I work three days a week. So as private practitioners, if you're looking for a model uh, that will attract a really high-end clientele and not lock you into the PPO or DMO or whatever your country's um, government dental plans uh, use, as a very international clientele, I've noticed, but in every case, we as dentists are still businessmen if we're in private practice. And so if you are going to work in a fee-for-service practice, you are competing in the world now, and you have the choice to discount your services through some kind of insurance plan you join, or you can go for a high-fee, high-quality environment where you can really interact with that patient and learn to do something more quality. So hopefully this will, will be stimulating to you and you will learn terminology that in the world of the internet now, when patients come up to you and say, do I have a cavitation or is there anything wrong with mercury? Um, you don't just turn around to that patient and say, you know, you don't know what you're talking about, I'm the doctor, because that's the quickest way to lose a patient, particularly a well-educated, cash-paying patient. So hopefully today, if you come away with nothing else, and you don't even believe me, um, that there's opportunities out there, you're going to learn some new terminology so that when that patient turns around to you, you at least can, a little light will go off in your mind and you'll say, well, I understand what you're talking about, and hopefully you'll, you'll learn to address it. Now, I'm going to be giving this lecture in two weeks at Columbia to the dental school. Um, I've been an alumni there for 30 years. It's, it's taken them 30 years to allow holistic dentistry into the American dental schools, um, which has been very frustrating because I've been knocking on that door for a long time. But uh, we had a new dean, and he's claiming that he's going to be more open to new paths for the university and um, giving that lecture soon. Uh, the schools are changing, though. NYU has now recently dropped mercury from their curriculum. And it's only too soon because like schools like Columbia are teaching mercury still for a public that, uh, to my knowledge, in America, nobody wants mercury fillings. So why are you teaching students things that they're never going to use? Hopefully you're going to learn terms about BPA, which we all know as bisphenol, uh, which is in many composites. Uh, many patients go and, and ask their dentists, can I have a BPA-free composite? And the dentists look at them and don't even know that BPA is in their fillings or in their partial dentures or in their full dentures. And that the possibility exists that you can have laboratories and companies like 3M manufacture BPA-free materials. In fact, the companies were well aware of BPA, which is in plastics and bottles, and as it heats up, BPA volatilizes and is considered an estrogenic agent meaning it can change the, the testosterone levels of children. Yet it's used in sealants. Sealants have the most BPA of any composite because it's a volatile product. Why are we putting BPA in children? So 3M and many of the other companies now are changing over to BPA. And it's a simple thing when you buy your products to ask the manufacturer if they're BPA free. You will also learn about sleep medicine, tr alternative treatments to periodontal disease using things like ozone irrigation, and an integrative practice. So an integrative practice not only has regular dentistry, I have six other dentists who work with me of all the different specialties, but I've got four other holistic healers who do things like cranial sacral, lymphatic drainage. In the past, we've had acupuncture, and we do uh, nutrition. Dentistry is changing, and, and we are uh, educators, but hopefully we're educating toward the future and not just repeating the same information about mercury and things that the dental profession has been 
using forever. The world is changing, and medicine is changing rapidly in this country, too. Uh, I'm addressing this to my understanding of uh, American-trained dentists, but, and correct me if I'm wrong, that in the world it's the same thing. If you're dealing with an educated population, they're, they're in medicine it's the same thing. They're looking for functional root cause resolution of disease where you use preventive procedures and not wait until the disease is fixed. In dentistry, that means we're not going to be carpenters anymore of teeth or just tooth carvers. We're actually going to be doctors of the oral cavity. So that implies that we are responsible for doing oral cancer screening. And I would say the most empower powerful thing you could come away with today of what I, I'm going to talk about is what makes me a holistic dentist is, uh, I'll tell you a story. Um, I don't know if you know the actor William Defoe. He's been in a, out there a long time, probably in a lot of Batman movies. He's a very famous actor. And he came to my office recently, and I said, why did you want a holistic dentist? And he grinds his teeth, and he's looking up. And then he says, doctor, because of your intentions. And to me, that was so powerful. Why are my intentions any different than any other dentist out there? And as I thought about it, I sort of made some sense, because uh, just after him, a patient comes in who's a new patient who came in with a deep cavity and a virgin tooth, the previous dentist, looked at that x-ray and immediately said, you need a root canal. Well, the patient doesn't, didn't want root canal. Root canal's getting bad press. Uh, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, so the patient came to me, and I excavated it, put an IRM. Tooth was put in a couple of weeks later, filled the tooth with a composite, and the tooth was healed, and the patient was very happy. The patient comes in all the time saying the dentist, they told the dentist, I don't want mercury. The dentist look at him and say, shut up, you stupid. I'm the doctor. And the patients come to me. You, if you continue as providers to do the same old model where you are the doctor and the patients are the victims, you're going to lose your business. And yes, you can discount your business till you're giving it away for free. But as a dentist, we still have the same obligation, the same clinical need and effective malpractice, whether we're getting paid a dollar or a thousand dollars for that procedure. So why not get paid a thousand dollars and do it well? And to do that, you have to educate your patients. You have to not just pull out the drill or the injection. You got to spend the first 15 minutes shutting up and listening. So I consider myself a tooth whisperer. So the first thing I do is just listen to people and rather than shouting at them that I know the diagnosis and this is what you have to do, I just listen to them and I think that's a great thing. Another thing is that we as providers, we're dealing obviously with humans, people have said that, who have their needs, and to do that with love and caring. For instance, one of the doctors recently in my office, a Dr. Verma from India, uh, a patient came in who had cracked her front teeth on the ice. New York was very cold last year. Uh, she slipped, broke her front teeth. Dr. Verma made some beautiful crowns for her and then sent the woman flowers. She sent the woman flowers. Not the, and the patient was like, my God, this is the first time a doctor of any type has ever shown love and caring. They, I mean, she's, we can all make great crowns, hopefully. But this is the first time that a doctor showed some real sense of caring. So I, I really believe that intentions and the way we present is a future model, doctor, of, of how dentistry should be, although I appreciated your points. Um, some of the things we're going to talk about, of course, the oral systemic connection, um, that's got a lot of press about the microbiome, uh, that the, the mouth is the portal to the digestive system, and that depending on what you eat and diet can affect the way that digestion occurs, and that overuse of antibiotics has, is affecting everyone's general health and destroying the good bacteria in the microbiome. And there is a lot of use now in prebiotics to help treat periodontal disease and general digestive health. Um, there's a, a, what's called the inflammatory model of general medicine, which is that things like infected root canals or toxins like mercury or digestive diseases, like the, doc, the doctor who introduced me, can 
inflammatory digestive diseases can set up further diseases down the road in an inflammatory model for your whole body leading to autoimmune diseases, cancer, heart disease. And we all have heard about how dental infections, chronic dental infections can lead to, to heart disease and low birth weight babies. So we know there's a definite connection between the mouth. You can't separate the mouth. Dentists have been putting blinders on their whole career so they could focus on that little tooth when in reality they've lost focus of the product that there is their patients. Another thing is acid-base buffering. Um, I think the saliva is your natural environment and we don't give the saliva enough credit for keeping our mouths healthy. But because of the modern Western diet, uh, and we're gonna talk about diet later if we have time, we be, have become very acidic. I measure every patient's saliva acidity every time they come in and keep a log of that to see what their profile. Normal saliva should be about 7.2. I find on average it's about six. And salivary acidity is leading to a lot of other medical conditions. It leads to periodontal disease. It's a marker of your general body chemistry. It could also be a marker of diabetes. It, it shows it can lead to erosion. Uh, in this new world where we grew up on fluoride in America, the kids, um, I'm finding that mostly what I've done for 30 years as a dentist has been to replace my own work or other dentist's work. You know, basically doing the fillings over, which lead to root canals or crowns and then periodontal disease. There's that whole model of invasive dentistry that almost feeds itself. And, you know, the crowns don't fit perfectly. There's a little open margin, which then creates a periodontal defect. And if they had virgin teeth, because they, under 30-year-olds now in America are all grown up on fluoride and they generally don't have that much decay. Um, it, it changes the whole business model of dentistry. So dentists, yes, we're doing implants, but basically what are the dentists? I tell my students at Columbia that you may be the last generation of dentists in America because uh, as you age, what's going to be left? Trauma, a little orthodontic work, and maybe a little perio, but basically there's no more crown and bridge. So you've got to grow with this, and, and we have to learn that we are treating the whole body, and we're going to talk about things like sleep medicine and how that's a nice new profile for dentists, and facial development. Uh, there's, I, I'm involved with sleep medicine studies in, in young adults. They find that student behavior and child behavior and development is based on lack of sleep, and that if you do expansion orthodontics, where you open the airway, you get mandibular protrusion, which opens the airway and for good facial development, which goes against all the orthodontic techniques where they used to extract the premolars and squash everybody in and close the airway and cause TMJ and all the iatrogenic dentistry that's been done when I was learning about it. And we're also going to talk about simple things like detoxifying, which you can do with coconut oil pulling. The mouth is a very uh, transient place for drugs to go in and out. You know how you can take um, sublingual drugs. When you do oil pulling, you, you, you generally use coconut oil, but you could use other oils. Basically, you swish it around, you don't, five minutes is good enough, and then you spit out, and it pulls some of the toxins out. Some of what you're gonna to learn today is just about giving informed choices to the patients, and that education. What I suggested is if you want somebody to pay above their PPO schedule, uh, that's something that's used in America, that's like a middle level of insurance where the dentist agrees to uh, like a 50% cut in his fee, but he's, given a, he's put on a list to get business. But how do you get patients like that then to pay? A lot of them just expect that you're just gonna work off the insurance. So it's difficult for American dentists to, to create value, then get patients who really want good work. And you can do that by, by educating your patients into the dangers, for instance, of the mercury amalgam. Many dentists will take out the amalgam because it's cosmetic, but only 10% actually follow the protocol that's been established by the Holistic Dental Association. Now, every dentist in this room knows how to do it. The most important thing you got to do is use a rubber dam. If you use a barrier when you take out a mercury filling, you're doing the main thing you can to prevent exposure. It's good to put some eyewear on the patient, some nose cover, uh, have good suction, try to take out the mercury in chunks. 
But the main thing is not to vaporize it and let them swallow all that mercury that gets in their mouth. And they rinse into the sink and they look at all that black stuff that we know that's coming out. And to pre protect our own staff, to use masks, air filters in the office. Um, it's proven that, th that the more filling, mercury fillings you have, the higher your blood level of mercury. So the ADA's position right now on mercury is that there is not enough proof that dental fillings cause disease uh, from the amount of mercury we're getting, although the amount of mercury in the American public is astronomical right now. I, there was a recent study of placentas in children that found six times higher levels of mercury in placentas, and children are much more exposed fetal to mercury. Of course, in the new world, you're gonna, you can do things like check compatibility to allergic patients. Uh, the ADA says it's okay to remove mercury if the patient's sensitive to mercury. Well, that's sort of idiotic because everybody would be sensitive to mercury, but if they're sensitive to, to certain metals, like they can't wear not gold, um, there is a company called Clifford Reactivity Test that does a simple blood test and it can determine whether your patients are allergic to every dental material and will send you the book and it's a simple test they can take. Another thing is, of course, we should use digital x-rays. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with um, infected root canals, but basically my opinion on root canals is probably 50% of root canals are unnecessary. Uh, once again, the classic situation, the patient comes in, the dentist already has a preconceived notion that that tooth is gonna be a root canal and they don't make any effort to try to save it, or the tooth has already come in with a long-standing periapical lesion, and then they do the root canal. And the success rate long-term of an infected root canal is very poor. As we all know, the uh, anatomy of a tooth's got thousands of microtubules tubules running through it, and just chain cleaning out the main chamber, there's no chemical you can put down that chamber. Uh, even though we use ozone, we use lasers, none of it really cures that infected root canal. So what you're doing then is you're locking the bacteria in, which creates a metal, medical problem long term. Patient may not have pain anymore, but you're locking the bacteria in, which leads to things like NECO. NECO is a chronic necrotizing infections, and there's the foci theory of disease, that people can get long-standing diseases from these dead zones in the bone after the tooth's extracted. So, I have a real problem with root canal, and as I said, one of the biggest uh, advertising things that I do is alternatives to root canal, which is basically about intentions. Uh, and then when we do extract a tooth, we do what's called a cavitation. And cavitation is both a noun and a verb. It's a, that infection, that cyst that we know exists at the end of a root canal is a cavitation, but to clean that out and scrape out the socket and remove the periodontal ligament, and all of that and scrape down to the bone. It's basically a good surgical technique is to cavitate the socket. And as far as bone grafts, uh, I don't believe in any of the animal bones should be used, bovine, cadaver bone. We don't want any of that. We're using the um, platelet enhanced. Uh, so it's the patient's own blood. We draw blood from their arm, centrifuge it down, inject it back in the site. Patients love it. It's their own blood. It's like a blood transfusion of their own. You're not getting some pig bone put into your head. Um, the other things we're doing is, of course, a lot of digital dentistry. I, since I don't use mercury for 30 years now, um, was never great with composite fillings, large composites. I found it was very difficult. And for a while now, I've been doing the CAD CAM system, <clears throat> which, of course, is somewhat expensive. But there's a new one I'd like to recommend, which is the 3M scanner, which is an open platform. And you can use it for dentures and other kinds of restorative. But it, it will go directly to the lab. But I have great luck now with the Roland milling. Um, it uses a lava block. And the whole system, you can get a scanner with a miller from Benko for about 40 grand, which is about a third the cost of the old Serona, Serec, and Henry Schein systems that are out there. And that's gonna really save you a lot of money. The blocks are very inexpensive. The nice thing is the lava block is a hybrid material that uses both resin and porcelain. So it's more biocompatible than your strict porcelain. Uh, you can make crowns, single crowns, inlays, onlays. Um, it's not fired, so it's not as 
cosmetic for laminates, but um, most dentists I know are not using CEREC for laminates. They're basically doing posterior restorations, and this works great. It's a small machine. It's a dry miller, so the insulation is minimal, and it's a really good setup. So that's what I would go to if you were trying to get away from mercury. And of course, digital dentistry is the future is maybe you're going to be online consulting. Uh, I'm looking into that right now because I get calls from all over the world. People say, what would you do, doctor? And they send me their x-rays. So um, I want to try to, by informing the patients, I feel like I can actually affect their treatment because they now, when they go to their dentist in, I don't know, pick a place, wherever, um, I obviously can't control the dentist, but by the patient being educated, they can control the dentist to some extent, their um, modality. Um, I'm also talking about creating, you know, the future wave of a dental spa as an alternative source of income. A lot of dentists now are doing cosmetics, but you can add things like Botox, not very holistic, but you can do a cosmetic spa. And we also, as dentists, are the front lines treating diseases. So maybe one day we'll be checking people's DNA and things like that through their saliva. There's a lot more tests coming out. But saliva should be as good an indicator of disease as blood eventually. Um, so in an integrative practice, the, the basic plan is to use other kinds of healers as alternative sources of income and as a value addedness that patients come to my office and say, well, this is great. I can get acupuncture instead of an injection for a filling. And I've done four wisdom teeth with just acupuncture on a patient. Basically, I have an acupuncturist who comes into the office. They have to administer the acupuncture during the procedure. As anesthesia, it only works really well for patients who have had experience using it before, but it can definitely work in a dental environment. Uh, and there are people who don't want Novocaine or anything. They've had problems with epinephrine. I generally use Carbocaine, but in any case, it's an alternative. And, and acupuncture can be used for a lot of um, healing modalities to strengthen their immune system. We're also getting into facial acupuncture because I think as dentists, when we do orthodontic work, we do a lot of Invisalign. Um, and we do non-extraction, we never pull premolars, we expand the arch, expand the face, um, elevate the dentition, it's like a facelift, and I've seen great results, and you do that with little facial um, acupuncture, and, and their faces tighten up, and you're not doing any, it's like plastic surgery, so that's a whole other cosmetic way. We use biofeedback to um, handle people who have TMJ, stress, anxiety, and dentistry. Reflexology, there's this point right here in the middle of your hands. When you give, if you have your patient pinch that side where they're getting the injection, while you're giving the injection, they won't feel the pain of the injection. So they can use that for headaches, migraines. I also bring in uh, health counselors who can help people with quitting smoking. And uh, oral cancer we talked about is such an important obligation of dentistry to do oral cancer screening. I have a veloscope. I, I actually brush biopsy is my favorite, CDX. I don't know if anybody does CDX here. I use it a little differently than it's decided. Um, CDX was, came out of pap smears, and when they do pap smear, they scrape the wall, and they don't see necessarily see a specific lesion. We're taught that we have to only do a brush biopsy when you see a lesion, but by then it's generally often too late and Veloscope and Visalite aren't great. Uh, so I, I often more profile the patient. So anybody who's 50 years old, history of smoking, tobacco, heavy alcohol, immediately gets every two years a brush biopsy. And I, you know, I choose what it looks like the most likely spots, but I've found oral cancer in patients who had no symptoms, nothing soft tissue, no spots, anything, and I feel like I've saved people's lives and uh, we should be doing that. And then, you know, the health counselors can help support your program that you're trying to get if you're getting somebody to uh, do better hygiene and stuff. The hygienists aren't always that good at, you know, following up on that. We also use cranial sacral. Uh, a therapist comes in, which is a very light touch, manipulate the head and plates. If somebody's getting orthodontic work, in real orthodontic work, you're actually manipulating the plates of the skull. So. There's muscles and things like that that can be assisted to relax. And lymphatic drainage is one of my favorites. I have an oral surgeon. Patient comes in half hour before they're having the wisdom teeth out. There's a special way to drain the lymphatic system where you clear it. You clear the lymphatic, drain the channels so they don't get the swollen lymph nodes. 
They also, you're, by doing lymphatic drainage for about a half hour before, it loosens up the uh, facial opening. And a lot of the trauma of oral surgery is the doctors and the assistant's hands and the patient's mouth. So if they're a little looser, there's a little more blood flow in there. Pre-surgery, they get better healing, and a week later they come back and it helps drain off that lymph node and stuff. So we do a pre and post lymphatic drainage. Um, people ask, well, how do you charge for that? We, the, um, the health service people are on salary, uh, and we do charge for it if we, and sometimes, I, I'll throw it in as a give it, just as a nice thing if somebody's got a problem. But we do charge for it. And um, other thing is myofunctional therapy. And I was talking about sleep medicine and how as dentists, we can get so much involved with snoring and sleep apnea. Um, I do a lot of studies on that. And we teach people different ways to, uh, to speak and to we have functional therapies. So. Um, sleep medicine, I think, is, is a really nice future. It, the only treatments for sleep apnea are, are either surgery, which doesn't work, the CPAP machine. So if you have a, a sleep apnea, one of the doctors was showing the appliance that she constructs, which is a repositioner. That's sort of a standard product. I actually would prefer to do orthodontic work, like with Invisalign. So if we diagnose that they have sleep apnea, we put them through Invisalign if, if we find that that's the problem, that they generally overclose, some overjet, overbite. And that's a permanent solution rather than being married to a, a sleep appliance, which you might throw in immediately. Um, but in the dentistry, we have a lot of things we can do. We use homeopathy. We talked about how it's not what you eat, it's what you digest. And if you're going to, you, you have to support the good bacteria that's in the body with probiotics and things like mercury actually are digestive disease uh, weakening systems. Um, getting back to the root cause resolution that we as dentists have an involvement with the medical health. Now I do a holistic hygiene program which you could all if you're in private practice institute. Of course we do the scaling and root planing for anybody with a type 2 perio. We have a periodontist in the office but for the hygienist they do the scaling and root planing we then use ozone irrigation. Ozone is a simple machine, costs 200 bucks. It puts basically O3 into water, and then we irrigate with an extra oxygen molecule molecule because the anaerobic bacteria don't like oxygen. So we irrigate subgingivally, and we teach them to do it. <clears throat> Doctor. And you just make it every day. Go quick, five more minutes, okay. No, no, we, we're five minutes over. Okay. and. Um, so we talked about the mercury, and just quickly, um, Weston Price was one of the most famous people in, in holistic dentistry, and he talked about um, diet being so important. And one of the things I heard, everybody knows about sugar and, st and being no good, we, we were all taught on that. But there's a new thing called phytic acid they found, which is in grains and breads and all those things. And that actually, phytic acid blocks the, um, minerals by reabsorbing, remineralizing your teeth because it makes you acidic. So if you want to remineralize early decay, and you were talking about that in, in uh, I think in the country you were talking before, you can do that by alkalinizing the saliva and you can do that through more water, less dehydration, um, using alkaline water, and by reducing phytic acid by sprouting your grains. So traditional societies use sprouted their uh, sprouted wheat products as part of their fermented products. So that was part of their, their breads and stuff, always had sprouted. But now, with all the Western diet, everything's processed, killed. And that's actually making us sicker. So, you know, that's a good thing to get involved with. And remineralization does work, but you have to check the patient's pH. And I am pretty much done. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Any questions? Thank you.